Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mrs. Crome. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. May I know your problem? Well, I feel that I have jaundice and a pancreatic mass. And recently I've noticed a new murmur, bacteremia, and fever. What's your age? 64, doctor. Okay. Do you have a cardiac history or else any shortness of breath called orthopnea? or attacks of severe shortness of breath and coughing at night, called paracysmal nocturnal dyspnea? No, doctor. Are you getting chest pain, palpitations, or syncope? No, doctor. You have any past medical history? I had diabetes, hypertension, and transient ischemic attack long back. Okay. What medications are you taking? Acidophilus supplement, cholesteramine, Creon 20 three times daily, Diovan 160 milligrams twice daily, Lantus 10 daily, Norvasc 5 milligrams daily, Novolog 7030 10 units at noon daily, Pamelor 15 milliliters every evening, Vitamin D3 one tablet weekly. Are you allergic to any medication? I'm allergic to codeine, Coreg, and vancomycin. Is there any family history of illness? Well, my daughter has a history of a murmur. My father died when he was 75 due to chronic heart failure. Okay. Well, your laboratory data shows sodium-133, potassium-2.8, chloride-99, bicarbonate-31 glucose 75, BUN 12, creatinine 0.8, calcium 8.6, total bilirubin 3.2, AST 63, and ALT 43, white count 5.4, hemoglobin 9.1, hematocrit 26.6, and platelet count 128,000. Lipase less than 10. Your abdomen CT diagnosis shows a pancreatic mass with biliary obstruction. Previous biliary stent is present. Your electrocardiogram shows normal sinus rhythm. There are no acute ST-T changes. Your temperature is 98.8, heart rate 96, sinus, blood pressure, 138 over 55, respiratory rate, 20, and oxygen saturation, 92%. You have newly developed murmur that has occurred in the setting of fever and bacteremia. You also have a pancreatic mass with jaundice, hypertension, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia. Take Diavan and Norvasc for blood pressure control. I recommend that you should undergo an echocardiogram. This will be to assess the possibility of endocarditis, which may be contributing to these symptoms.
Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello there, my name's John and I'm going to be the doctor that's looking after you today. Hello John, nice to meet you, uh, nice to meet you and thanks for seeing me today. How should I address you? Uh, I'm, to please call me Kevin, yeah. I'm here today because I had a bicycle accident on Sunday morning and I was wondering if you could check me out. I've, I've hurt my shoulder and, and my wrist and I'm just a bit concerned about it. Okay, Kevin, uh, this is the first time that we've met, I, I believe. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I'm 53 years old. I'm in pretty good health. Uh, I'm about 83, 85 kilograms. Probably could lose a bit of weight. My cholesterol's at, at lower than um, average levels by far. I, so. And what about your blood pressure? Is somebody checking that regularly? Yes, again, fine. If not on the low side, yeah. If okay. anything, I tend to be on the low side of, of blood pressure and that type of thing. And you're not on any medications at the moment? No, nothing. Are you allergic to anything? Um, no, um, never been allergic to anything. Uh, I bicycle regularly about 100 to 150 kilometers a week. Have you ever smoked? Uh, no. What about alcohol? Uh, not too much. I, I tend not to drink that much at all. <laughs> when you do drink, what do you prefer to drink? Recently I've been just having uh, New Zealand whites, actually. Yes, and how many glasses a night would you have? In a week, three to four. I mean, but that's like two on a Friday night and Sunday afternoon, that kind of drinking. It's, it's pretty light, really. Okay. I'm conscious of drinking and smoking. It's Any history in your family in terms of your mother and father with diabetes or heart attacks? No, nothing like that. No, it's... Yeah, my mother was a heavy smoker. She was a very strong woman, but she smoked a lot. My father uh, also had uh, a bit of heart problems. He ended up having a, a pacemaker for 30 years of his life. I'm 53 years old, he got a pacemaker at 54, so I'm very conscious of the, again, staying in shape because of my mm. father's experience. Um, he had that for 30 years. Um, but it was never that he had a heart attack? Or, no, no, it was just simply the, the heart started. He lived till 84, 85 years old, so perhaps I should tell you um, one part of my life story. I was in West Africa for several years. Probably the biggest health crisis in my life was living in West Africa for a long time. Um, have a lot of stomach problems, uh, um, problems with giardia, um, malaria, and actually amoebic dysentery. Those infections brought my weight down to about 60 kilograms, so just terrible, <clears throat> if you will, uh, diarrhea constantly. Yeah, and I imagine that you would have required medical treatment for the, your, your various conditions as well. Did you spend any time in hospital? So we used to go to the uh, local embassy and get treated by embassy medical staff. At the time, we were getting 500 milligrams of the anti-malaria medicine chloroquine, uh, and then we had various antivirals and shots, but pretty, pretty um, minimal medical care, to be honest. Yeah. But, but since then, I, I've been fine, actually. I've been here in Australia about 20 years and was originally born and raised in the States. I see. Can you tell me more about the accident? Yes. Just recently, I went over the top of a friend I was bicycling with, went over the top of him and ended up just smashing myself on the uh, asphalt. And oh, it hurt dear. my shoulder. Yeah, it's terrible. To be honest, he wasn't paying attention. We had just stopped and they were just getting going again. It was Sunday morning. He slammed on his brakes and then I went over the top of him and then into the traffic, and, and luckily, I pushed both of us out of the way before a car came uh, roaring past. And Wow, that sounds like quite a large accident. Everybody managed to walk away from it okay? Yeah, we were laughing about it, you know. You didn't need to call the ambulance or go to hospital for anything at the time? No, we didn't even think about it. It was, again, we were laughing about it and went to the coffee shop. It was only, you know, as I came home and after the... Uh, coming home and resting for a while, I realized I was in more pain than, than normal, if you will. How long before the pain started to come on? 
Uh, right after having coffee, to be honest. I, I think the adrenaline went down and just coming home and finally kind of reflecting on the whole thing. After the accident, as you know, bicycles have... Uh, That is the end of part A. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Michael Juarez, he's a 64-year-old here with onset AFib. A history of type 2 diabetes and a stage 2 wound on his left sacrum. He's allergic to penicillin. He's married and lives at home with his wife who has Alzheimer's. Okay. He's alert and oriented times 2 and he's unable to ambulate independently. OT worked with him yesterday. He responds verbally. We're actively titrating his amiodarone drip. His lungs are clear. His blood sugar was high before breakfast and he got 7 units of insulin. His last bowel movement was 2 days ago. Uh, he's retaining urine due to BPH. Uh, he's on a cardiac diet and is due for a stress test at 10. Did you get all that? Wow, this is a heavy load. I better get started. There's a new admit coming from the ED. It's your turn to take it. He's come into room 346, and the nurse will be calling with report. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Question 26. Now read the question. Do you need something? Yeah, I think I'm going to need some help with my patients today. All right. Okay, I just sat down. Give me a minute. I don't understand these new nurses. They don't want to work hard. They think everything should be given to them. That we should just stop what we're doing and help them. This place is going to send me to an early grave. I've had to precept all these new nurses and manage 40 beds. We never have enough experienced nurses. And now our patient satisfaction scores are way down. I'm tired. Question 27. Now read the question. When I asked you for help earlier this morning, you seemed a bit upset and overwhelmed. I know we've been very busy on the unit and we got slammed this morning, but um, the response made me feel demeaned and a little embarrassed. It's important for me to feel supported and respected when I ask for help. And with your help, I know I can be a great nurse, I can support the unit and you, and we can together better care for our patients. I am so sorry, Jaslyn. I did not intend to make you feel bad. It's been a crazy morning. Besides everything here, I got a call that my mom fell at the nursing home. No. And you know, I got all those monthly reports due at the end of the day. I do value you, and I will remember that. Let's get going.
Question 28. Now read the question. Hi, Dr. Walker. Yes, this is Carolyn Hall. I'm calling um, concerning Virginia Woolf in 347B. She's a para one, gravita one, and she has a massive amount of bleeding that saturated that, that saturated her bed and is pooling on the floor. Yes, and right now she's unresponsive and her blood pressure is 86 over 40. Her heart rate is 122, her respirations is 12, and her O2 sat is 90% on room air. Yes, she had an un uncomplicated vaginal delivery this morning and we gave her some Percocet and Ambient about 90 minutes ago. She has a saline lock on her, in her right arm and it looks like a hemorrhage and I think you should come and assess the patient. Okay. Question 29. Now read the question. Oh my gosh, what is wrong? What do you think is wrong with her? Uh, it's, it's not unusual. But why for, is she bleeding like this? Look at the blood on the floor. The nurse, uh, It's just awful. It's, it's not unusual for uh, a mom to have the baby and stop oh. bleeding. This is not unusual. She's not talking to me at she all. Will, she'll talk. The nurse is calling the doctor. Okay. And sometimes after having a baby, uh -huh. the uterus is not contracting as it's supposed to. Uh -huh. That's what's going on. That's why okay. the primary nurse asked that I massage the abdomen okay. Do you so think that we we'll get it firm. Do you think we'll have to give her blood? Okay. okay, let me read that back to you. You said you want normal saline, one liter bolus, IV, O2 on a non-rebreather, and you want her to keep, our, keep her sats greater than 96. Question 30. Now read the question. The situation is that a 42-year-old female with signs of chronic liver disease presented here about two hours ago with pre-syncopal symptoms after hematemesis and melina at home. On arrival, she was tachycardic and hypotensive, but responded well to fluids. We were working her up as a variceal bleed when she had this further large hematemesis. She's now looking shocked again, with a pulse of 110 and a BP of about 80 on 50, and we are about to start a unit of blood, a PPI and some oxyotide. On exam, there is no evidence for CITES, so I haven't started antibiotics. And? No other background story known at this stage, other than 10 years of high alcohol intake of about 60 grams a day, and a 30-pack year history of smoking. She's not had much in the way of investigation for her disease yet, although she does say that her GP told her that drinking had caused severe damage. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
I wrote a prescription for antibiotics. Okay. Um, I did want to talk to you, though. I'm a little bit concerned looking through his chart at how many ear infections he's had recently, and I, I noticed that you had checked the box that someone's smoking in the home, so I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about that. Well, um, it's just me and him, and I do smoke. Um, I try really hard not to smoke around him, but I, I've been smoking for 10 years, except when I was pregnant with him, but it, everything, it's so stressful being a single mom and, and my, having a full-time job, and so it's just, that's why I started smoking again. You have a lot of things going on, and smoking's kind of a way to relax and de-stress. Yes. Yeah. Some people have a glass of wine, I have a cigarette. <laughs> sure. And it sounds like you're trying not to smoke around him. Why did you make that decision? I know it's not good for him. I mean, I've read those things about ear infections and asthma and stuff. and, and uh, But other kids have ear infections, and their parents don't smoke. So on the one hand, you're worried about how your smoking might be affecting him. And on the other hand, you're not so sure if it's really the smoking that's causing these problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have asthma. Yeah, I don't... He hasn't had a lot of other problems that his other friends have. So, and I've thought about quitting before in the past, but I just don't. I just don't see how it's possible right now. What made you decide to quit smoking when you were pregnant? Well, he was inside me, and we were sharing everything, and I knew that he would get some of that, and I didn't. I just didn't. Didn't think I could live with myself if something happened to him. Right now, though, it feels almost too difficult to even manage or even to try. Yeah, exactly. How were you successful when you quit before? I don't know. I, I think about it now. I don't even know how I did it. I just, I just did it. You know, I just, I just couldn't imagine, like, him not being born or going into labor early mm -hmm. and, and him having problems and stuff like that, all the stuff that they talk about with women who smoke. So I, that was just enough to, to say, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to risk that. Mm -hmm. So the risks were so scary then that you're able to stop. Like, yeah. They don't feel as scary to you now. No, I mean, we're two separate people. And like I said, I don't, I try really hard not to smoke around him. I'm pretty good about that. I, I don't let other people smoke around him. Um, so I, you know, you're doing the best you can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me, too, like part of you really does want to quit. Yeah, I, I, I know that I need to. And I, you know, keep every new year I say, okay, this year I'm going to quit smoking. But then something happens and it, it just doesn't. It's I'm on your to-do list. Happen. It's just not making it to the top. Yeah. If you did decide to quit. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all confident, you don't think you could do it, and 10 is you feel pretty certain that you could, where do you think you fall right now? Probably like a 5, kind of in the unsure area. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I've done it before, so I know I can do it, but at the same time, it just seems really hard, and sure. it's not the same situation. Well, what made you say 5 rather than 2 or 3? I know, I know all the ways it's bad for me, and I don't want him to grow up thinking that it's okay to smoke. I don't want him to, to use any kind of, I don't want him to chew or, or anything like that. Um, so I know I need to, especially before he gets old enough to understand mm -hmm. what mommy's doing, but I just don't know if I can do it. Okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why you'd like to quit. You have been successful quitting in the past. And right now you're just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it. Yeah. Where do you think we should go from here? I don't know. I, I'd like some help. I just don't know what kind of help I need. Sure. So. Well, if you'd be interested, that's something I can definitely talk to you about. There are a lot of new options that can actually help people be way more successful in their attempt at quitting. There's different medications you can try. I don't like medicine. Okay. There's also a lot of support groups and classes that you can take where you have other people to go through it with you, and sometimes just having that support can be a big part of it, especially for people like you where smoking is such a stress reliever. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure if I have the time for all that. Sure. It feels like something that would take up a lot of time and maybe not fit into your life. 
I wonder if we could talk about some options that might fit into your life. That would be really nice. Okay, well if you're willing then we could set up another appointment where you could come in and we could talk more about that. I would like that. That would be great. Great. Thank you. Sure. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a GP called Dr. Edward Symes giving a presentation about how the condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME, affects young people. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. My name's Dr. Edward Symes, and I've come to talk to you today about a complex illness called myalgic encephalomyelitis, usually referred to as ME, and its effect on teenagers and adolescents. ME is a chronic neurological condition that affects many body systems, causing a variety of different symptoms, almost always including pain, feeling generally unwell, and sleep disturbance. I'd been working as a GP for about 20 years when my own daughter was 14 or 15 and one of her friends, let's call her Emma, was diagnosed with ME. She'd taken weeks off school and none of her friends really knew what the problem was other than that she was tired and not very well. The problem had started with a nasty bout of flu that she never fully recovered from. As time went on, Emma's friends seemed to abandon her one by one, as it became clear that even the shortest or most moderate forms of mental or physical exertion worsened her malaise and exhaustion. She ended up being excluded from almost every social activity, as she just couldn't cope with any exertion. The impact of this on her physical and mental health troubled me, as there seemed to be very little understanding and tolerance for her condition and she was falling behind academically as well as socially. It was a chance meeting that resulted in me deciding to specialize in ME. One day I bumped into Emma's mom at the local pharmacy and we ended up talking for almost an hour. She was clearly desperate for someone to talk to. It was having a huge effect on the family. 
She'd had to give up her job in order to take care of Emma, as her anxiety was made much worse by being at work when her daughter was sick and alone at home. It's well documented that ME is a physical disease, and there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that it's psychological, but there's so much misinformation, and there's no therapy or cure. Emma's friends had apparently spoken about her skipping school or getting out of things that she didn't want to do. There seemed to be a general feeling that she should toughen up and get on with school life as they had to. As a result, poor Emma's confidence had hit rock bottom. She felt that people saw her as lazy or attention-seeking. That's when I decided to turn my attention to researching the illness. Somebody who's so ill shouldn't have to worry about proving it to everybody. Another extremely unhelpful aspect of the illness is that it's so difficult to diagnose. What we really need is a valid laboratory test we can use. At the moment, we just have to go through the patient's medical history, analyze their symptoms, and try to exclude other illnesses. Sadly, this often means that many young patients suffer the illness for years before they're diagnosed, which is a shame because an earlier diagnosis helps to reduce the impact through support and intervention. Another issue is that ME can be tricky to identify in younger patients as they don't always report symptoms accurately. The seriousness of the condition can be hard for them to judge as they may think that feeling exhausted or ill is normal and have learned to pace themselves and simply take part in fewer activities than they would if they were well. A reliable blood test would avoid all of these problems and might mean that the illness finally gets the attention it deserves. Perhaps the most challenging thing about having ME is the fact that it's so erratic. You just don't know how you'll be feeling at any given point in the future, which makes planning difficult. This often results in sufferers missing school and key social events. Feeling left out at a time when you're trying to establish your identity can trigger confusion and depression. And let's not forget that they do all of this on top of having to cope with debilitating medical symptoms. That's why I really want to emphasize that teenage sufferers require a lot of support and understanding from their families. For example, help with managing their social lives and visitors, because it can be difficult to keep friendships going. Another important point is that they shouldn't be put under too much academic stress, made to help out a lot at home, or keep up with physical exercise. A lot of parents think they should soldier on, but that's often the worst thing they can do. Trying to battle through is likely to lead to a total crash and a prolonged recovery. Sadly, there is no intervention or therapy for ME, but that doesn't mean that as health professionals, we can't help our patients to manage the symptoms and improve their quality of life. We need to be willing to try several and work out what makes the symptoms worse, what makes them better, and help the patient achieve a balance in their life so they can improve their daily function at such an important time. Because the symptoms vary from patient to patient, there isn't one single method that can be used. Patients want and need a GP who at least validates the illness and acknowledges its effects. They also appreciate us providing ongoing support and regularly reviewing and monitoring progress. We should be giving appropriate documentation and information to the family and school so that our patients are more likely to be believed. The patients themselves need to be involved in the process and adapt to life with the illness by respecting their physical limits and allowing themselves adequate rest. Before I go, I want to briefly mention one controversial method of treatment that is sometimes prescribed, and that's cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Whilst it's been helpful for some pediatric patients, the effects on teenagers are modest at best. Claims that it can cure the illness are not supported by any follow-up studies. The theory behind it is that the patient is so frightened of the illness that's usually brought on by exercise that it worsens their health. 
CBT can be used as a way of getting back into exercise. However, the illness cannot be worsened by attitudes, and this theory goes against current understanding of the disease. It has led to patients being blamed for their failure to recover, and even worse, it frequently leads to severe relapses, as it usually insists on some form of exercise. On a final, relatively positive note, I should say that the majority of severely affected adolescents make a full recovery, and most others improve sufficiently to lead near full lives. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.